to learn podcast hi everybody hope we're having a good tuesday afternoon um we'll be of course talking about news but because the news have been yeah what it is i should have been thinking about how do you deal with uh you know how do you deal with um with sort of switching off with all the news there's, there's, to me there's times when i just want to just switch off and and just play and they was like well isn't that what a lot of people who we actually criticize in this podcast think about right they think about no don't uh don't, don't bring politics into don't my bring politics games. into this because i just want to have you know i just want to enjoy the game which is fair enough i guess um um so we're going to talk about it uh, i think we're going to have to do some caveats of course but overall i think it's not a, as a horrible in, as an impulse as we like we have made it out to be here uh if you sort of take it on a, at least in a surface level but before that we're gonna talk about news and there's quite a bit of news uh to talk about uh at least that like we was able to dug, dug dig up um some of them of the bad news category or good news one could argue depending how you look look at it let's start with uh, over at bloomberg uh by jason schreier uh, on the technology page, uh, Blizzard workers share salaries in revolt over wage disparities. Uh, mm. Employees circulate spreadsheet to com- compare pay, recent raises. Activist CEO gets, Activision CEO gets forty million, while some staff keep meals. And this is supposed to be a high tech industry where people get six, you know, six figure salaries, you know, at, on average. Employees at Blizzard Dim and Division Activision Blizzard Inc. began circulating spreadsheet on Friday to anonymously share salaries and recent pay increases. The latest sample rising tension in the video game industry over wage disparities and executive compensation. Blizzard, based in Irvine, California, makes popular games including Diablo and World of Warcraft in 2019 after an internal survey revealed that more than half of Blizzard workers were unhappy with their compensation. The company told staff it would perform a study to ensure fair pay, according to people familiar with the situation. Blizzard implemented results of that study last month, which led to an outcry on company internal Slack messaging boards. <laughs> One employee had created a perspective encouraged staff to share the comp- compensation information. An anonymous document reviewed by Bloomberg News contains dozens of, of preferred Blizzard salaries and pay bumps. Most of the raises are below 10%, significantly less than Blizzard employees said they were expected following the study. Uh, this year, Blizzard top performance pursuit salary increased about 20% more than in prior years, and more people got promotions, Seller added. Our overall salary investment consists with prior years, she also said. Uh, this is uh, Activision Blizzard the spokeswoman Jessica Taylor. Um, um, and it continues on. Um, and, and I think it's, it's interesting. You know, and there's another paragraph. It's internal message interviewing by Bloom. Bloomberg, Bloomberg News, the Blizzard employees said they were struggling to make ends meet while watching Activision Blizzard revenue grow year after year. Some producers and engineers at Blizzard can make well over $100,000, but others, such as video game testers and customer service representatives, often paid minimum wage or close to it. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is something that we talked about before. It was on my mind when they started talking. Blizzard Entertainment has tried to remain autonomous from a parent company, but in recent years, Activation corporate office has pushed the game developers to, to cut costs. Last year, the company eliminated hundreds of jobs and asked some of the remaining staff to take on the responsibilities of those who were to let go. That extra work did not come with more pay, according to the people found with the company, who has not to be identified dis- discussing sensitive private information. Uh, one veteran Blizzard employee told Bloomberg News they received a raise of less than 50 cents an hour. They're hmm. making less now than they did almost a decade ago because they're working fewer overtime hours than they did back then. Several former Blizzard employees said they only received significant pay increases after leaving the two other companies, such as nearby rival Riot Games in Los Angeles. So, living Blizzard to go to a company with a, a reputation for sexual harassment got them a higher pay. Oh, jeez. Uh, wow. You know, I part of me, too, is like, uh, heard, like I heard that's like... Oh, you didn't get paid. You're making less because you get paid overtime. Well, it's like, in a way, it's like at least you got paid overtime, unlike some other you know game developers that don't. Mm-hmm. But like, again, that's that's still shitty either way. Even if they still get paid overtime, honestly, you shouldn't have to work overtime in order to make a decent living. Mm-hmm. And 
and, and this falls, and that last couple of lines I, I, I talked about, I talked about something we were speculating, I was speculating particularly about the relationship between Activision and Blizzard. And I, one of the predictions I said was either Blizzard was going to, you know, separate itself, or it was going to be subsumed, it was going to be, you know, mined out by, uh, by Activision. And that looks like that's what's happening. They're basically just gouging Blizzard for all they can get from them. So, yeah. Maybe Blizzard is not long for this world. Um, it, uh, I, we've said it before. You and I. But it's not easy. <laughs> no, no, it's no, not. No, it's not. But it, it, do you, like, do you need more, more of a reason to unionize? There you go, right there. Yeah. Uh, so, other news, back when you could make a game, uh, uh, what to call a AAA game within a year or so, Super Mario 64 took 622 days to develop, suggests Giga League document by Ian Walker over Gotaku. 600, so about two years. Hmm. Uh, so much voice is one of the best games of all time. Oh, okay, that's fine. Discovery that first shared by Twitter user e Ecumber, who tweeted a screenshot of a text file that appears to be tell the development period of Super Mario World Cup Red Purposes, Nintendo 64 launch titles period of creation. The document read started in September 7, 1994 and lasted until May 20, 1996, so roughly about two years, which one month before the game June's 23 release in Japan, all told 622 days. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it is interesting uh, inside of how games were made, uh, and two years back in the day was seen as something that was pretty, pretty lengthy, right? You could, you, you know, games could be turned out for about a year or so, so like 12 months. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes into kind of the example that the complexity of how more complex video games have gone. Granted, there there's technology that makes it easier, but I think it it kind of gets outweighed by like how how more intricate video games are, are becoming. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not to say that making video games in the past was easier, but I think like because the technology and the and graphics were really limited even for their time, they it, it was kind of easier and quicker to put out mm -hmm. than than well than a lot of video games should be nowadays where you know unfortunately we see that that like oh well we pushed it out door even before it's done you know like here it's half done and then we'll just patch it later to make it kind of get caught up with that i mean nintendo 64 uh, and super mario 64 uh where where one of those games and game consoles that really were in the transitional phase from 2d to 3d so mm -hmm. right there you had a, a and this is one of the things I said about going from 2D to 3D, uh, increased voice acting and other measures that really increase the cost and time for making games. But that doesn't necessarily explain why they ballooned in some other areas and there's some other reasons for that, including advertising and the like. So yeah, but it's, you know, it, it kind of tracks with that evolution that, you know, I discussed and we talked about before. Uh, over at GamesIndustry.biz, uh, Rebecca Valentine says, Take two next gen software prices hike reflect the quality of the experience. This is an interview with CEO Strauss Selznick, says he does not expect the industry to coordinate any software prices, however. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and again, we get the, the tired line from the industry. It hasn't been a price increase for, for frontline titles for a really long time, despite mm -hmm. the fact it costs a great deal more money to make those titles, and he replied. And we, we think that with the value we offer consumers, yes, microtransactions, and the kind of experience you can really only have on next generation consoles, uh, debatable, that the price is justified. But easy to say that when you're delivering certain extraordinary quality, and that's what a company prides itself on doing. Ah, hmm. uh, yes. This is me rolling my eyes. Because this is the other side of this discussion. The, 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 the you know, techno speak or or um corporate speak oh we haven't raised prices even though an actual game nowadays if you were to truly buy it would cost you hundreds of dollars and you have to have spreadsheets to figure it out which version of the game you want to get all the goodies <laughs> but sure yeah that's quality but we have better quality i don't know what exactly that means but apparently it is a thing uh, talking about that, I'm going to jump, jump ahead and see if I can find a piece of news. 
because that sort of ties in into this. Uh, well, I, I don't think I have it, but yeah, you probably saw it. Is that uh, uh, Spider Man is not going to be part of the oh. versions of the new Avengers game uh, outside of Sony's platform? In other words, you can get it if you have the PlayStation, you get Spider Man, if you're playing on PC or Xbox, no Spidey for you. Yeah, so I was going to bring this up. It's like, I don't understand why we can't have, like, varied, uh, varied uh, writing for different video games. Uh, I don't, it seems that a lot of video games have flat prices. Like, every, it feels like every triple A game has, like, that $60 price tag when all video games are not e made equal. In a way, I kind of feel like we're sort of taxing, they're sort of kind of taxing their um, budget, uh, their budget titles that may not be really worth $60 to kind of make up for the fact that maybe this, the other game that they put, they spent way more money on that they are selling for $60 should really be selling for like $80 or something. Yeah. And I don't understand why we can't have like, you know, why can't one version, you know, why can't this one game be fifty dollars and then this other one maybe like sixty five dollars to kind of reflect like actual budgeting and stuff like this is a it's sort of like a i think this is sort of like the video game industry doesn't have like this weird rule it's not written anywhere that every video game needs to be sixty dollars mm -hmm. it's just some arbitrary thing that they've all just kind of do because that's the way it's always been i'm sure maybe there might be like some sort of marketing research crap but it's not a rule like you don't have to adhere it you could try something new you mm -hmm. could try varied pricing and as much as people will probably hate me saying this is like well if one console has like like if the sony version of that marvel's game that has spider-man in it maybe that one should be cost a little more mm -hmm. and maybe the other one should just cost the 60 dollars or something like so people get mad and, and i as a consumer do kind of get mad too when i see like a game that gets released across the board steam you got steam uh playstation and xbox i as a consumer i hate the the fact that like a lot of times a game might be 60 dollars on uh, xbox and playstation but on steam it might be 50 dollars, like at launch but I, i'm sorry like that as much as it sucks for a, as a consumer, I don't think that like, I don't think that I should be mad at like the the people who choose to uh, patron theme over the other consoles to get penalized because I'm paying more. If anything, we should be the ones like, hey, how come you're, how come we we're getting charged more when you're selling it over there, and that's not that we want you to increase the prices over there. Mm -hmm it's like what's going on the sony like is it because sony is char like taxing essentially putting a tax on their on the developer for and the publisher for the privilege of having their um their product accessible to to uh, playstation owners or mm -hmm. xbox owners yeah i mean it, it's I think it, it's time people should kind of really like push back against it, not just uh, these arbitrary ideas. And sure, I think I honestly I think they should be increasing prices on some games, if, especially if they're put, sinking that much like marketing money and all that, all those all that extra fluff. Mm -hmm. If the if that's if they really feel that their product is worth more and enough to invest that much money into marketing, then why not increase the prices? You're sure that it's going to sell, that it's the, the greatest thing ever made. Maybe, maybe if we start pushing back on these prices, they'll maybe curtail their spending when it comes to marketing like that. It's like, okay, so, you know, they'll, they'll actually look at the product. Okay. So this is real gold. We're going to spend a little more on budget, you know, on marketing that we are going to have to increase the price of the game to, you know, $5, $10. And 
put it out there, but we think it's worth it because we really believe in this product kind of thing. Yeah, but my problem with it is, first of all, I think it's, again, a lie. The, whether 60 or 70 or whatever, the base price is, is a lie, right? So that's, that's the base yeah. price where you start in, with AAA games, not the... Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and that's the other thing, too. The, the problem with my, like, argument is it doesn't take into account all that other crap. of All, all the other crap that they pull in, the, the pre-order bonuses, the uh, uh, pay the extra, the digital deluxe version, the super mega deluxe version, the super mega... Ultra Deluxe Collector's Edition Turbo version. Yeah, and the microtransactions, which will then we make more of the money. And and they literally <laughs> construct many of these games around microtransactions, especially the sports games. They're all they're not real vehicles for you. I mean, they say that there's been many comparisons across multiple generations where they take in like Madden, they take in uh, NBA, and they're literally it's the same game. They might have spruced up the graphics a little bit or maybe changed the roster. It's literally the same game. So it's like, you're charging me for something that you've been doing for decades, you know, and sort of the closest thing to a sort of a factory turnout of a game, but now you're charging me more because you're, you know, according to Stras Stras Nick's like, oh, this is the best game ever, and it's gonna be fantastic. It's like, what does that even mean? Better graphics, better yeah. performance? It doesn't mean anything, it's just corporate talk. You know, and, and yeah, that's, and that's that's the other problem with my thing. It's like you're also deter. It it falls back into the sort of the same trap is that you have these, uh, these executives are making like the bullshit calls of like what they think is good and what the players really want, kind of crap. And instead of like being confident in the actual product themselves, it's they're controlling the narrative, which I think sort of leaps into another story that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that was on the docket about uh, what the the CEO or somebody from um, Ubisoft being like, oh yeah, you know, video game women in video games they don't sell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the um that guy that just got fired or yeah. what's his name? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, the, the guy I call what's his name basically last name. Yeah, yeah, and Jim put up the perfect video and i always long thought this of myself for for a game company that posts uh we celebrate diversity of our of the people who make video games and stuff but you you have put a female in in the leading role of your games and behind the scenes you don't think it, you will never do it because you don't think it can sell unless you have a a man holding her hand and you know being on the both on the front cover yeah but not really they usually mm -hmm. don't put a woman on the front cover probably i mean that's sort of we talk about those sort of uh you know virtual signaling by corporations and when it comes to people i always believe that either people somebody's a hypocrite or they're not that term doesn't apply but corporations definitely do it's like oh look yeah again we're we're before we're wake woke whatever but we're also exploiting our workers to the point that you know they are now filing an action class styled lawsuit in France against Ubisoft. That's the next piece of <laughs> good. Uh, uh, this is in both in French and in um, in English. The Solidaire Informatique Union Syndicate Solidaire, uh, which is the union of information uh, workers, announced that it's working on a collective lawsuit action against the Ubisoft, Ubisoft Group. The repeated acts of harassment and sexual assault, set sex at, and discrimination, discrimination, as well as the impunity that the group has subjected to over many years, must be explained to re and repaired. We, the exclusion of a few permanent, the exclusion, I'm firing, of a few permanent individuals such as Sergey, what's his name, is not enough. As those who have benefited from the group activities are hiding under their leadership, as many testimonies have come out over the past few weeks show the whole sexist, homophobic, and racist culture that we need to destroy. Need to destroy in the entire video game and computer industry. Well, as these guys are gunning for it. Uh, this is their, of course, this is the sort of call to action. And this is a, what is called in France, translated to a collective action um, lawsuit. Uh, now, France does have essentially part of their government an entire section which is dedicated to protecting and representing the workers. So, workers' rights are supposed to be stronger. In France, than it is United States. The United States would fall usually on their class action suit, and class action suits have been weakened considerably over the the last couple of decades uh, by mostly conservative um, courts and the like. But the fact that this and and the fact that they, they they the language, I mean, it's translated from the French, 
but it is to destroy, you know, this, the sexism. Uh, that's, that's pretty strong language, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see how, what happens with that. But it seems that, yeah, again, if it happens in France, France is part of the European Union that can also spread across the European Union, like you know, stuff with microtransactions and could actually have some real impact across the industry, at least we hope. Um, in some other news, uh, PS4 controllers won't work with PS5 games. Mm. Um, in a post in a PlayStation blog this morning, Sony detailed which PlayStation 4 controllers and accessories will work with PlayStation 5, especially controllers like Steam Wheels, Sony wireless headsets, and PlayStation Move controllers work just fine. Mostly because of VR. I don't think they want to launch, they have a uh, plan to yeah. launch a new system for VR. The PS4 DualShock 4, however, will only work with supported PS4 games. It sounds more like software than a hardware situation. Yeah, so, because, you know, as much as it sucked between the PlayStation 3 and the PlayStation 4, at least there was some um, logic to it, because there is that uh, technically an extra button on the controller mm -hmm. and the touchpad fit, uh, um, capability that no one really uses at all. I think I've maybe used it once or twice in video games, and it was optional. Um, but that said, it's like, I don't think there really is any real game changer uh, feature in PlayStation 5 controller. So this just seems kind of, um, it seems very petty because it's like, oh, like, I just got the, my PlayStation 5 and this multiplayer game that we can sit like, you know, coach, uh, couch co-op. Let's, uh, here's my PlayStation 4 controller because I didn't have enough money. Oh, nope. Got to pay. Got to spend that extra seventy, eighty dollars now because the prices of controllers have gone up too. Uh, to to be able to do that, it's just it's bullshit. And especially, I remember when it's like, oh yeah, none of your peripherals from a uh, PlayStation Three uh, will with the PlayStation Four, and then magically VR became a thing, and the PlayStation Move controllers are suddenly compatible. Mm -hmm. My PlayStation, my PlayStation 3 controllers, move controllers from the, work just fine with the PlayStation 4. They're not any different. They're the exact same controllers. And Sony basically, I think, I think that, that, first off, I think the PlayStation Move is underrated. It works really well. It, it was the best motion controller uh, gimmick that I've used in, you know, the generation before. But to me, if like a, hey, we got like this old stock and like design and chipsets and all that, let's just recycle that, repackage it and sell it for way more than it was selling before. Because I think it was originally $50 for one controller. Mm -hmm. And now they're, they're forcefully selling them as a pack for $100. Yeah, brand new. It's like um, I got like a PlayStation Move controller for like twenty five, and actually found like another one for like twenty bucks, still brand new in the box. It's like you, you guys are just. Uh, it's like the. It's just freaking Sony liking their proprietary branding and crap, and the thing that killed the one of the many things that killed the Vita with the stupid memory cards. Yeah, it has hurt Sony in the past, and a warning to Sony, be careful, because you are you could be harming your new chances again. Which we talk about how both companies sort of go back and forth between Microsoft and Sony, where Sony's on top, and then they start making boneheaded moves, reminding people what they didn't, the, the, the things they didn't like about Sony, so they tend to switch to Microsoft, and then Microsoft gets com overconfident and said, oh, we're the king of the castle, and then Sony comes in and runs on the radar, and then Nintendo, of course, doing its own thing because that's Nintendo. Nintendo doesn't care. <laughs> Nintendo, Nintendo's outside the castle, like, yeah. playing in the sand and building a little sand castle. <laughs> yeah, it used to be, Nintendo. you know, Sega does what Nintendo don't. It's like, uh, Sony and Microsoft do what so uh, Nintendo doesn't care <laughs> about, you know. Um, and this is some interesting news, especially for retro players out there. After eight years, Space Quest Spiritual Reboot is playable. This is by Luke Plunkett over Kotaku. Last week we had some bad news about a game that had kickstarted in 2012 and still isn't out yet tonight with some better news. Fans of classic Sierra series Space Quest might remember that in 2012, the co-creators of the series, after a very long gate estrangement, reunited and pledged to develop a whole new sci-fi adventure game. The game is Space Venture. Wow, that's pretty good naming, I guess. And after eight years of development, those backlit 
the game at $30 or more and now getting the chance to play an early beta build of it. So it's still alive after eight years. Talking about long developments, eight years into development, Star Citizens fans are increasingly upset that Star Citizen is still being, being Star Citizen. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but this time, I just consider Star Citizen to be one of the biggest scams in the video game industry. I, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I mean, when they started talking about microtransactions, they trying to up to $10,000 for yeah. uh, for ships. I was like, what? Nope. It's a, it's a scam. It's a scam, yeah. And I think the problem is it's kind of a scam that nobody wants to admit it's a scam because I think the developers don't think it's a scam. Right, they're just like, well, we're just making the best game ever, so yeah, and and it's playable. You can actually play aspects of Star Citizen, the first person shooter, and all that. But again, that whole idea that games are never completed, always online, and all that—it's it's this is a prime example of how it can just go sideways. It's like, what the hell? You just just release the game already, for God's sake. Uh, anyway, talking about PlayStation, the PS3 emulator can now play some online games. Uh, look oh. at uh, RPCS3 has long been the best way to play PS3 games on a PC. It's now also a place where you can play some PS3 games online on the PC with no need to use PlayStation Network whatsoever. For well, the past year, developer Gal Siv has been working a private PSN server replacement called RPCN. The team behind the emulator says in advance, this is a free and open source private se server that can act as a PSN written in Rust. Hmm, interesting. Uh, Persona 5 is now available on PC via emulation. I think they're gonna re no, they release. But, but, but I think that's one of the reasons why Sony is moving to release all their games on PC, especially the older ones. They don't want emulators to you know to take over that space. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean they could solve this problem easily if they can get like I guess PlayStation Now functional, especially with PlayStation 4 games and mm -hmm. their back catalog. I mean, they're they're working on it at least, but I they they're just not at the level as as like Microsoft with their Xbox Pass and yeah. their backwards compatibility. Uh, this is a choice. Halo Infinite multiplayer might be free to play, according to Ethan Gash, and it's confirmed that it is. Uh, Microsoft said the confirmation on the leak store listing is true. Halo is for everyone. The company tweeted, we can confirm that Halo Infinite multiplayer will be free to play, but it will support 120 FPS on Xbox Series X. Um, hmm. So it's free. I thought it was always free. Hmm. That's okay, sure. Uh, talk about Take Two. Uh, we talk about uh, how they're going to jack prices, but at the same time, Take Two Private Division to publish games from the makers of Ori. Ori Armello and Oli Oli. Uh, this is by Jonathan Bolding over PC Game. Private Division is publishing the next Kerbal Space Program and publish the Outer Worlds for Obsidian. Uh, Private Division has partnered for several prominent game studios such as Moon Studios, League of Geeks, and Roll7 to publish a game from each developer. Titles of games haven't been announced yet and none are expected to release until 2022 at the earliest. Now this is what you were talking about earlier, about having a spread of games and prices. If Take Two does more of this, then I think that would certainly, and and they they tell the CEO to keep his mouth shut, right? <laughs> About, you know, games being more expensive, and you know, then actually, yeah, it would be cool because it's like, okay, you want your high end triple quad A game that is a remake of the game you've been playing for the last five years. You want to pay an extra ten bucks for that, fine. But here's a bunch of little games like Kerbal Space Program at twenty, thirty, forty dollars. They're fully released, you play them, and you have fun, and you do that. So different games, different prices for different sectors of the market. If that were, and I think it's increasingly becoming what it is in the business, I got no problem with that. You can, you know, I'll never pay $70 for an NBA game, because I'll probably never buy an NBA game, period. But if you want to do that, that's fine by you. Uh, talking about sales, um, GTA 5 sold even better after its Epic Store giveaway. GTA Online is having the best year ever. Again, it hits 135 million, as it hit 135 million sales. Um, now, Unstoppable Money Making Machine, that is Grand Theft Auto V, is still going strong in 2020, with publisher Take Two predicting an even stronger year for GTA Online in the fiscal year ahead. It said its Q1 earnings call on Monday. Take Two praised, again, Take Two, 
praised a strong performance GD Online since the Diamond Casino update last year and record-breaking activity, active player numbers. But what's really surprising how well the GTA has sold, even after it was given away for free <laughs> on the Epic Store Game Store. So, seventy dollars. That's the thing. It's like it's all over the place. Take two. You're oh. just so. I I think I I sort of understand the logic though. So. They had it free for a few, for uh, what, a week, I think? <clears throat> yeah. So they had it free for a week. People downloaded it. Those that actually uh, played it, they you know, started probably playing the online thing. They're, they're like, hey, oh my God, this game's fun. They tell a friend, it's like, hey, like, this is fun. I got it for free. It's on sale, though. Like, you should hop on and play it. They go out and buy it so they can, uh, they can tag along. At least uh, that's what I'm. I'm assuming is probably what happened there. Yeah. If if it's the actual prices of the if, if the actual copies being physically sold, money being exchanged and stuff, uh, because I'm assuming that yeah, you gave it away for free. Of course, your microtransactions are going to go up. Yeah. So um, this is not technically gaming news, but it's kind of related. Microsoft is serious about trying to buy TikTok in the U.S. Uh, this will be made by mid-September uh, by Paul, Paul Lilly. Uh, this is uh, the, not the decision, the, the article, the PC Gamer, which is weird because it comes out of the uh, pronouncements uh, the, out of the White House, well, particularly the President of the United States, that he, that he was planning to ban TikTok in the United States based <laughs> on many TikToks uh, being critical of the president uh, and his policies. I'm not going to go into the presidential policies or any discussion of that. It's not the time for it. Maybe some other time, but not here. Uh, suffice to say that that was it. And then Microsoft said they want to buy the American part of it. But it still be a Chinese. Basically, it would be a partnership between Microsoft in the U.S. and Chinese company in China. So it is almost like they're putting... Uh, you know, um, putting a, an American face to a Japan, a Chinese company. Uh, yeah, I don't know too much about TikTok. I know people have been, it's something that's cool with the young people. <laughs> or, I mean, and that it, what is, so it feels like it's Vine. Is it essentially it's Vine, Vine yeah. again? It's Vine. So what's the difference between this and what Vine was? I don't get it. Uh, well, basically, Vine was an American company that went under, and TikTok sort of swooped in and take took to the um, the space. But also because it's a Chinese company, has been uh, accused of you know um, espionage, espionage, and exploiting data of users in ways that people are not comfortable. So you know, and also <laughs> not blocking political TikToks in the United States, but not allowing the same freedom in China, mainland China, mm. so. Yeah, but unfortunately that's not what the president is. Why he wants to ban TikTok. Uh, still, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like, remember that last venture of uh, Microsoft, what was it called? I, um, um, ah, I forgot. Actually, I, I legitimately, I already legitimately forgot what, what the name of it was for the joke. Uh, the streaming platform, Mixer. Mixer, mm -hmm, there yeah. we go. Yeah, what, what happened to Mixer again? Didn't yeah. Microsoft buy that? And then it just Facebook all of a sudden. Got a hold of it. Basically, they, they switch it over to Facebook. So they're now it's yeah. Facebook Gaming. But yeah, but I'm like uh, that, that was a venture that. Uh, didn't work out too well for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So does Microsoft own a... I, I'm pretty sure I probably asked this last time, but does Microsoft have a stake in Facebook? Uh, I don't know. Probably as a minor stakeholder. You know, companies by each other. I'm not really sure. I, I haven't checked that out. Or maybe they just uh, made but, an, you know, they just made an offer for it. It's like, sure, take it. We don't care anymore. The, the lives the lives of, uh, of corporations mm -hmm. that us piddly people can't understand. <laughs> yeah. Talking about corporations and and, and and social media, again, another article by Andy Schalk uh, over PC Gamer. Teenage mastermind arrested for July's massive Twitter hack. The 70-year-old old Florida teen is now facing 30 felony charges. Police have arrested a suspect, a suspect in the month's major Twitter hack that <laughs> compromised high-profile accounts belonging to Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Apple, 
Uber, Barack Obama, and a dozen others. The Hillsborough State yeah. Attorney Office said that the investigation will be FBI, the IRS, the Secret Service, the U.S. Attorney Office of the Northern District of California, and Florida law enforcement agency led to arrest a 17-year-old alleged mastermind of the hack. Uh, a 17-year-old, ma- damn. <laughs> yeah, messages posted compromised Twitter account last follows to make payments to Bitcoin accounts and promised to pay double the deposit amount in return, a way of giving back to fans. That might seem like a transparent ploy, but it was affected. The team reportedly pulled more than $100,000 in a single day. Hmm. Like, yeah. wow. I, so even if I was like a bright, like 17 year old hacker, I think 17 year old me would have been like, hey, I'm going to make them say stupid stuff. Yeah. yeah. And not, not like, oh, I know I can scam people out of bitcoins by posting some bullshit thing. Uh, talking about Xbox, uh, this is from Jacob Riley, Riley over PC Gamer. Xbox aims to bring all first-party games to the cloud on day of release. Halo Infinite will be available on your mobile phone on day one. Microsoft now public access to its pu- cloud gaming service, Project X Cloud, as part of the Xbox Game Pass Ultimate from September 15th. From that day, users will be able to play over 100 games beam from the cloud to their Android device and it's intent to push the latest Xbox Game Studio video games to the cloud on day of release from here on out. Xbox Game Pass Ultimate Combination, both PC and console passes, Xbox Live Gold, and from September 15, Project X Cloud to select games. For select games, it's clear Microsoft intends to use subscription server to be a one-stop shop for gamers in the near future, at all in 15, at $15 all in, and the inclusion of a cloud gaming should certainly help get a little closer to realizing that goal. I mean... Again, just like what happened with Stadia, it all depends on how well that, you know, my cell phone, if, if the power goes out, let me give an example, and I'm not using Wi-Fi, it's a little box right here you can't see, right, I'm, I'm tapping at it, I live in a somewhat, uh, you know, an internet hole, right, it's not, I can make calls, calls kind of come mm-hmm. through, but anything higher data, 3 or G higher, it's, it's it's sucking, right? I have to use Wi-Fi calling for that. Uh, so that means that it's like, oh, yeah, uh, okay, I'm playing a game, power goes out, I'm going to go to my cell phone. No. <laughs> uh, no. So, again, just like what happened with Stadia, sounds great. It worked for a lot of people, but it's all based on infrastructure. And for a lot of places, and including myself, where I'm a streamer, the infrastructure is not there. Even if I it's, feel like, and, and of course, the next yeah. days will be power, but also my cell phone infrastructure. So you know, it's I yeah. Know. Didn't didn't um? I feel like the Vita had this at launch. Like it, there was something with AT and T that you can have like a three G capabilities. I'm not sure if that was something that was built into the PlayStation itself. Mm-hmm. It was the software thing, or if like you have to have like a phone that's sort of like tethered to it together. But even then, I wouldn't think that um, 3G would be would work that great for um, online gaming. Like you can probably do like the minor things that you could do on PlayStation Network that isn't gaming, like sending messages between friends, checking your friends list, mm-hmm. maybe web browsing, and that's about it. Yeah. Now for retro gamers, back in Gotaku over here by Ian Walker, analog pocket pre-orders sell out immediately, leaving many disappointed. I didn't know this was a thing, but hey, I I will go for it if I can find if I, if it weren't sold out and I had the money. Uh, Seattle-based manufacturer Analog made a name for itself, producing aesthetically beautiful retro-compatible consoles that do a great job of displaying old-school games on today high-definition televisions. As such, the analog pocket was in high demand from the moment it was announced in 2019. The system, which is currently Edge. 1600 by 1400 display built in support for Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, and adapters for Game Game Gear, Neo Geo Pocket Color, and Atari mm. Lynx cartridges. Wow, Atari Lynx. Now, there were some cool cartridges for Atari Lynx back in the day. I've been touted as Cadillac of retro, retro handhelds, so it was, is wow. Yeah. A lot of excitement around the analog pockets have to do with how it plays all these games. There are no emulation involved. Instead, the high end portable includes two FPGA few programmable gator rate chips that can be configured to produce a ha- the handheld system question on a hardware level. Wow. An approach which has some exciting advantage over the much more common practice of emulation. 
The same thing else we used to great effect and all the more nice takes on Nintendo Temi System, Super Nintendo, and Sega Genesis, even if the products themselves have been hard to get hold of down to, to low manufacturing numbers. Uh, which allows to play pre order circus, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> yeah. I mean I want yeah. to see more of that. I want to see accessible, cheaper. If you if if you're gonna block the the route of emulation or get emulating your PC, then I get I want to get my retro um, consoles, and I don't want to get them from Nintendo. Say because they only can get me whatever games they have licensed, usually first party games. So yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at the website. It's like, wow, this thing looks fan. It like it looks gorgeous. It it's like a little a mini um. It's a Game Boy Color, and it looks like it's it has the idea of the Switch where you can dock it and you can play it on TV, but it has like these cartridge adapter things so that you can you slide it into the slot, and I assume you can slide it into like the video games, mm-hmm. or you can slide in your your physical cartridges and play it. Now, uh, even r- more ridiculous. Oh, look, you can buy a case for it so you can have it on display because it's. It is pretty, but now my biggest thing is like uh, I am very uh, dubious of like devices now, like these independent devices and stuff that promise like a bunch of stuff. So it's one of those. So like oh, I'm, I'm fine that it's sold out. I'll wait and see. Maybe if this thing is, if this thing is does what it promises and works as advertised then like i'll i could always if i'm interested in it i'll wait for a second run or something wait if for, there is one wait for mgv mvg to uh to review it or lgr and then then get your copy that makes sense. yeah essentially i've heard i've heard of some like devices too that like some essentially like a model uh, consoles like the the Sega there's a Sega Genesis one that apparently works really well it's like oh that that'd be pretty cool to have granted they're way out of my price range for buying them because essentially you're buying like a brand new console mm-hmm. but uh, like I can appreciate this kind of stuff again assuming was there a Kickstarter for it that's that's usually the biggest thing that's really it just all the horror stories we've heard of over the years of like, hey, like Kickstarter or GoFundMe pages with like these ideas for retro gaming, and it, it either comes out crap or it, it never, never, it never gets yeah. delivered. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I understand. Um, well, well, let me see. Uh, because talk about retro, uh, Battle Toads. It's coming out on August twenty this month. So finally, <laughs> yeah. So this... a lot of a lot of games are kind of sneaking up on me. Yeah, I don't know if I'm gonna try it though. I may try it. Just I I I, I think well, Battle Toast was in, if we want to know, Battle Toast was based on a Saturday morning cartoon of the nineteen eighties, and it came out in the NES the game, but it was it was notoriously uh, hard to to be beat. Uh, so now people have completely forgotten about the <laughs> the, the uh, animated show, right? Uh, but they remember the video game, and so the Battle Toads continue. It's like you know Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but Toads in space. Yeah, what was so. the actually was the the Battle Toads cartoon the same thing as like some a lot of the cartoons in the eighties were actually uh, toy commercials? Basically, yeah, that was it. So people forgot about the toys, the cartoon, but they remember the video game, and that's what survived. So. It's a uh, it's a thing, um, and I, going back to my final piece of news, GTA Online PC players will get new stuff exclusive to next gen. A Fraser Brown over at PC Gamer. At least two more updates are coming this year. Uh, GTA is heading for Xbox Series X and PlayStation Five, along with a standalone version of GTA Online, ensuring yet more updates. Exclusive stuff will be added to the sandbox that will mix. You will miss out if you play on Xbox One or PS4, but not on PC. Essentially, they want you to take this game to the again the next level, and this is the the second time they've done this because it came out. It was uh, it became a huge seller for the 360 back in the day. That's how old this game is, and um, the PlayStation 3. They made the move to PS4 and Xbox X uh, and PC, sold great again. And we already talked about you know huge sales with the free giveaway in Epic Store. 
and now they're planning to continue the game uh, on Xbox Series whatever and PlayStation 5. I mean, this is the, the flagship of games as service, right? The game that never ends um, for whatever reason. And I think it's, well, it's made a lot of money for Take Two, right? And Rockstar. And on that note, I think we can talk about, we're finally going to talk about um, our subject of the day in the podcast. And that is, with all the bad news that have been coming out of the video game industry, at some point, I'm beginning to think that people who say, you know, uh, I just want to play my games, I don't want any politics or anything like that, kind of have a point. Because, again, this is recalling a conversation we had on one of my streams uh, when I was doing um, uh, Dragon Age Inquisition, and you ask, hey, listen, uh, you know, how do you feel about this game now that you know about all the Bioware magic and all that stuff? And I'm like, yeah. well, I, I know about it, but I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the game. So, you know? And I get, and, and now I get more and more the fact that, yeah, okay, Ubisoft is a horrible company, but doing cool parkour moves and assassinating people, it's so cool, right? Yeah. You're selling the same game over and over, playing football year after year, but you're enjoying it, right? Um, there's something to be said about not seeing how the sausage is made, right? And... And I want to make the distinction between people who are aggressively anti-HJW or whatever. Like, oh, don't, you know, you're ruining games because you're putting this stuff in. It's like, I think we're clear on that. That's, that's BS. But being able to just say, you know what, fine. I accept that these horrible things are happening. But, again, separating the art from the artist. I want to enjoy the game. And there's something to be said about just sitting with a game and just playing it for what it is. Even if it was, you know, came up, came too far for horrible reasons, right? Just, and not, yeah. not simply that, just simply switching off. Like, you know what? I'm tired of reading all these news, watching all these podcasts, uh, you know, switching on all these things. I just want to switch off and just play the game. Just be excited for games and play games and, and be done with it. And if it's good, but I don't care because there's nothing I can do about it and nothing I want to do about it anyway, so I just want to play games. I mean, is, 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 is there a validity to that kind of thinking, or can, or is it something that we simply cannot or should not accept? Uh, so, I, personally for me, like, I think it's fine to play something that you that might have had like a problematic development. It really depends on the person. Like to me, I don't think I can. I don't think I want to support Ubisoft for a long time until I feel comfortable. Until I feel things have changed. That I wouldn't. I wouldn't guilt trip anyone else. You know, for going out and buying uh, or wanting to play uh, good and e beyond good and evil two or something or their next success in street game. Uh, I I'm fine with that, but I think it's I I'm one that like switch it off if you want to, that's fine. I I'm of the opinion that people who there there's a difference between wanting to switch it off and then wanting to just outright deny it and just completely forget about it. I think it is important to be cool about how your art is made, how your how your products are made. There's a lot, like you said, a lot of people don't like the, you know, of how the sausage is made. Mm -hmm. Of really how a lot of the things that we we consume and we buy um, get uh, have problematic development. I'm watching a series by I think his name is Heavy Eyes on uh, sort of like the environmental impacts that that come with them um, making video games, whether it be making the physical copies, the packages, the, uh, how the, you know, the power that it takes to serve digital, uh, digital servers for downloads. And I think most recently he put up like a, um, 
a video on essentially like blood uh, blood metals essentially the warp of uh, mining and stuff for like cobalt or other precious metals that that are used in electronics for making consoles mm -hmm. which i guess like was called the playstation wars <laughs> and not not, on, not an actual like console not the actual console wars like playstation versus xbox but an actual like conflicts in the real world over mining yeah, there's, I think it's, I think you should be conscious of that, but you don't have to have it like linger on you. I, I don't think you should feel guilty all the time, especially if you're enjoying a product. But at the same time, I think you should be knowledgeable. I, um, right now, it's like I'm thinking of something that happened to me this week um, on Twitter. Um, an artist kind of posted the, so this artist had like a um he drew over essentially like a picture of of this bodybuilder like posing and he drew like a cartoon character over it like used that pose and someone called it like oh that guy's a nazi and this began the string of twi like of the twitter threads it's like well, why are you calling this person a nazi um the the thing that it, that was problematic was the tattoos I think the person had an issue with like the f uh, he had five percent written on his chest, which I attribute that to him being a shill for some company that calls itself five percent, and it has I think it has to do with bodybuilding and probably five percent fat. Hmm. But the thing that I pointed out was like, oh, he has that uh, I I can't pronounce it. I'm not even going to try. It starts with an R. That eagle, that like imperial eagle thing Reich with Stiker. the little M. Yes, yeah. the rice stacker on his chest. And then someone else, say, uh, some other artist, this is an artist, outright said, uh oh, -uh, it doesn't look like that. I'm like, yes, it does. Here's a picture of it. I, I had to like dig a, a look at a video to get a good image because a lot of it, a lot of the times that picture, that tattoo gets obscured. I'm like, yes, it does. Like, here's the image of one and here's his tattoo. Um, I got, I, 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 I call me like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, everything is like that and blocked me. And it's like, well, like, but then we, other people later also found like more tattoos of him, like kind of stretching or bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. And you can clearly see that the little emblem thing has this off the gun. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and yeah, like the video that I looked at to get a better picture, I think they color in his swastika or something mm -hmm. because it was a close promo shot or something. So it's like, oh, let's just pretend that's not there. Um, yeah, so that's the thing. It's like, okay, so now now this image that this artist drew, this completely different, the, this wasn't the same original artist that had that blocked me. This was someone else that came in who's mm -hmm. also an artist. Um, he, he posted like, okay, now I, I know there's problematic things with this post, but like, and honestly, to me, I didn't have an issue. Like I can enjoy his work knowing that the, that, um, that the original post is his bodybuilder who has a fucking swastika on his chest and is probably a Nazi. I I don't care. To me, that's not the problem I had. The problem I had was this other artist who was outright denying that it even looked like that, that it resembled it. And then just outright like started losing the argument and just uh, blocked. It's like, like what? That's just such a horrible and immature mentality to have it's like i'm not telling you you're a bad person for enjoying this thing that had a problematic pose of, of essentially model based on it it's like but at the same time you can't deny that that there was something problematic to it like i'm sorry i made you think that you that there might be something problematic with something that you enjoy yeah. But you shouldn't deny it. Yeah, it's Griffin. And, and especially be that hostile. Like, I don't understand the hostility towards that. Yeah, and that's something I wanted to separate uh, in the beginning, right? The difference between, you know, and Griffin, uh, welcome to the chat. Uh, yeah, the, de I wanna, the denial is sort of the part of the course, the dialogue around entirely to, to gaslight people into thinking that it's not exactly what it is, right? There is a problem with saying this is not real and being aggressive trying to deny this. There's no politics in video games or take your politics out of the video games, etc. 
I'm trying to, maybe there is no separation, let's be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe what I'm saying is it's also, it's, okay, let me put it this way. It's more about getting fatigued, right? About getting tired, you know, it's like, like I, we do this every week, right? I go through the news, we talk about it, and we have a discussion, whatever. And most of the subject is nowadays sexual abuse uh, and, and, and harassment and exploitation and all those things. But it comes to a point where you sort of get fatigued by it. It's like, I just want to enjoy my games, right? And, and I think there's something that we also have to admit that there is a certain level of fatigue with it, which, by the way, the video game industry kind of hopes and exploits as well. But if, they, if there's enough news out there, people are going to get tired of the news and then they, they can wait you out, right? Because you just want to play the games, right? Uh, you just want to have fun. And, you know, oh, well, this is problematic. Well, we've seen the same thing um, over at the tabletop uh, industry where uh, the makers of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, uh, Wizard of the Coast, is changing some aspects that they consider to be problematic. Something has been problematic for a long time, and you have people like me, it's like, yeah, fine, they're changing it. I have no problem with that, right? I, 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 and there's people who are very aggressive, especially the older, old school uh, people, like, no, you're changing it. And, and, you know, you're going to have more changes and those changes are going to be these other changes are going to ruin everything. And you're going back to the days of the moral panic and all that. And, you know, and that's sort of one of the things that steers it. It's like if you point to problems, one of the defenses is, oh, you're, go you're just sounding like the people who are doing the moral panic about tabletop RPGs and heavy metal and video games, right? You're a critic of the, of the genre and you're bringing it down. I'm like, not really in anything addressing these problems if they exist and they're real and so many times they are kind of protects the industry because when people go like aha uh -huh, you're enabling sexism it's like no actually we, there was sexism in the industry and we're dealing with it right <laughs> we're, we're actually doing something about it uh, yeah but, you, you you can't call me racist because you're the real racist <laughs> yeah um, for calling me racist and, and maybe to me, and maybe to you as well, many other people, we don't have a switch off. We can't really switch it off once we see it. Or we, no, a long time ago we became aware of these things and we've never been able to switch it off. And maybe we want to go back to, the, at times we want to go back to the time where we just didn't know. Ignorance is bliss. We didn't know how the sausage was made. We didn't know how, what, what it took and the ugly stories. I mean, I was talking about KOTOR 2. I didn't get to that part. But one of the things that really got me back into talking about KOTOR 2 was the revelations about Chris Avalon, uh, Ethics of Buying Video Games. Uh, thank you for the link. Um, mm -hmm. And revelations of, we talked about this in the podcast a couple of weeks ago, about his, you know, the way he behaved in, in not in, in not making the games themselves, but in, in, in uh, parties associated with uh, with his company, it's like he would flash around his Obsidian, you know, credit card, basically company card, yeah. and use it to buy, you know, and pressure women into having sex and buying them drinks and being very touchy, you know, touchy feely and stuff like that. And people were like, this is wrong. And it's like, again, we already had a podcast as how behavior, the personal behavior, and the brief flex in the games itself, like rape uh, scenes in in Far Cry Three, for example. There is a rape scene in Far Cry Three. That even people who are uh, uh, critical of Ubisoft kind of gloss over because maybe they don't even remember, or they don't want to remember the fact that they, you know, they had to play through a rape scene in a video game, right? Um, so there's that, right? It's there's some validity of being of trying to just switch it off, and it's like you know what, I'm just gonna play my game, I'm gonna have fun, and but at the end of the day, I can't I can't switch it off. I wouldn't ask anybody else to switch off. And trying to ignore the problem just makes things worse. That's just my take on it. Yeah, and it's just... I just... I really don't understand how some people can just outright just kind of like turn a blind eye to it. It's not It's not like a trying to enjoy the art in spite of like the the issues that I guess made the how how the art was made. It's just outright denying it and just trying to uh, completely separate it. Like because like how could you 
art is art. Like even the process of making art has an influence on that art because an artist might start with something different and uh, end up uh, in the process of, of making that art, they might change something because not because as they were making it, they saw something and they wanted to change it or fix it, or maybe they made a mistake and decided, you know what, that, that looks good like that. I'll think I'll leave it like that. Mm -hmm. The And I can see that being applied to video games. Like, what if, um, you know, someone's, like, I hate the, I hate the whole, like, the rape thing, but, like, what if someone was, like, working, you know, on Far Cry 3 and then they get sexually harassed and it's like, hmm, you know what, I think we're going to rewrite this scene here or, you know, it like that might have an influence on the final product. Like mm -hmm. the, their experience of working at the studio might like maybe ha led to some creative changes to it than what was first intentionally <laughs> thought of. Yeah. I mean, it's as horrible as it is to say, but it could. And I think people just don't want to acknowledge that, especially if it it does come to problematic content, like when it comes to really graphic violence or really or you know graphic sexual um, violence as well. The people don't want to. Some people don't want to acknowledge the. Maybe that takes a toll on a on the people making the art to put that in there. Because I think it's one thing, especially if, if this was like an indie studio where it's a very small um, group of people making this video game. And it's like somebody's personal story that they want to tell. Like, that, I think that's different than um, someone like just this big studio. And of course, you got your writers over here, the people who do the programming over here, the arts, uh, the artists over here, the People make the art assets over here. And then it's like, oh, I think I'm going to write this rape scene. You know, I, I'm a cis white male who's never experienced something like this. And I'm just going to write this rape scene because it's edgy. And, and I, I need to kind of get like a stir uh, out of people instead of writing something. Well, I'm just going to go to like the the easy way and just like write this like sexual scene and then just pass it along. And then everyone has to like. I, I have to do this thing, like program it. I mean, sometimes there might be like these back and forth about changing it and stuff, but then sometimes there's not. It's like, nope, you do as I say. Yeah. And I, I, I honestly, I, I can't. I can get like again wanting to enjoy your, your products in a vacuum. Uh, but then to be so hostile to people who point out issues and they and valid issues too, not not minor things. Yeah. I don't I don't get it. Yeah. Well, with that, I think we come to the conclusion of the podcast. Uh, Chapelman, where can we find you in the interwebs? You can find me at Chapelman pretty much everywhere. I am Chapelman underscore here on Twitch and on Twitter. But you can find me primarily on uh, YouTube at Chopamon. I'm still working on some stuff, so hopefully I'll have something out soon. Something big, probably big and ambitious for my channel. And uh, yeah, and uh, thank you, uh, Griffin Vermo. Viral. Oh yeah, and and yeah, quick comment to that gaslighting. There was actually someone else on that thread that literally was trying to do that. They. They were like, "Oh, how dare you accuse somebody of being a a Nazi? Like, you should you shouldn't throw those accusations, you know, so lightly like that." And I linked them to a picture. It clearly shows Sasuke. Oh, what's wrong with that shirt? He he says, it's "Like, come on, dude, really?" Yeah. Uh, and you can find me here. We do the podcast every Tuesday when whenever possible uh, on two o'clock Eastern. I'm also on Sundays over at Rectus Channel uh, on Let's Roll. Uh, with Griffin Varro and some other players uh, that we're doing still we're doing uh, the um, our Iron Claw game um, uh, The Isles you can find it also on the VOD over at YouTube uh, on, on the Rectus and you can find me playing most nights uh, probably hoping to do uh, if my machine holds to it uh, 
um, uh, what was it? No Man's Sky. I'm gonna give it a try. If not, we're gonna try to find some other game to play. Uh, but thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Griffin, and everybody else. And uh, we'll see you when we see you. Bye, everybody. Hi.